the establishment of the health message. And when we think about health and salvation, we see that they are intertwined. And there is a text I want to read with you. It's in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 51. John 1, 51. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So Jesus presents himself like this escalator, like this ladder, ladder between heaven and earth. And when we look at the health message in Adventism, it was step by step, like climbing a ladder, step by step. I remember a little boy who found one of these fire escape ladders in New Jersey, and he went all the way up. But once he got to the top, he didn't know how to get down. This is a ladder we are to climb, and we're never to come down. We're to keep climbing till we find Jesus at the end. He is with us every step of the way. We say that the message of health reform started in 1863 with the great vision uh, that Ellen G. White had on health reform. But that is not entirely true. Health reform was in Adventism way before that time. In the year 1854, so before this time, 1854, we have a message in early writings, page 121 and 122, that we should not use tea and we shouldn't use coffee which are two beverages so common. Before that time, in the autumn of 1848, already there was a publication uh, that stated that we should not use tobacco. And it even, it said that tobacco was a filthy weed. But when we really want to know about health reform in Adventism, we need to look at the life of a gentleman by the name of Joseph Bates. Mm. He was one remarkable individual in Adventism. He is the one that brought in three of the very strong pillars in Adventism. He lived between 1792 and the year 1872. Eighteen seventy-two. He fought in the battle of eighteen twelve against England and became a sea captain. And when we look at the life of Joseph Bates, it's like climbing this ladder that he 
took step by step. And I want us to climb that ladder with him in the establishment of the message of health reform. Joseph Bates brought to Adventism three of the green pillars. He was responsible for, well, I, I'm going to say four. On the second coming, he was a preacher with William Miller. Mm -hmm. He's the one that arranged a lot of the meetings in Massachusetts for Miller to come and speak. He was instrumental in the sanctuary message with Prosier. He published about the sanctuary in heaven. This is Joseph Bates. This is before Ellen G. Watt um, promoted these ideas. He was also instrumental in the Sabbath. He was one of the first Adventists to keep the Sabbath, but not the first, but one of the first as a Sabbath keeper. And what we'll study about today, he was the first health reformer in Adventism. So we're going to trace his life and see how he was instrumental in bringing about health reform even before Ellen G. White had these visions. The first thing was in 1821. 1821. Sister White wouldn't be born, I think, till 1827. So in 1821, Bates decided he would not drink any liquor or wine. He gave up liquor. And he gave up wine. No liquor and no wine. You know the difference between liquor and wine? In liquor, you concentrate the amount of alcohol by mm -hmm. distilling it. Mm -hmm. I've done it in the laboratory in, in organic chemistry. And the scriptures are very clear about the danger of uh, alcohol. Uh, let's go to the book of Habakkuk. Let me cite some verses that are not commonly considered. Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk is one of the small prophets. And because his writings appear in the Old Testament with the 12 small prophets. But he was a preacher of righteousness. And in Habakkuk chapter 2. Verse 15, he comments about alcohol. Habakkuk 2.15, and it says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, and that maketh him drunken also that thou mayest look on their nakedness. So Habakkuk says that alcohol leads to nakedness. It's associated. And in English, I don't know if it's here in Australia, but in the United States, if you want to go buy <laughs> liquor, you look for a place that says spirits for sale. Wine is spirits. Yeah. Says spirits. It'll say wine and spirits. <laughs> and spirits. Do you have that? Do you call liquor spirits here? I'm saying I'm seeing a yes. Mm. Where alcohol is concentrated. And it literally allows evil spirits into the soul, the drinking of alcohol. It opens the avenues of the soul for demons to come in. People act as if they had demons. And our word for alcohol comes from the Arab word 
Now, the Raul Escobar says it in his Encyclopedia on Health, comes from the Arab word al-gole, which means evil spirit. So alcohol is prohibited in the Quran. Although in many Muslim countries, they do sell alcohol and, and they use alcohol in parties, but legally it's outlawed by the holy book of the Quran. Now, we go on with the life of Bates, and he made another big decision in 1823. He decides to give up tobacco. He's at the port in Lima, Peru. He's a captain. He's talking to another captain, and they're smoking these cigars. And he says, I'm going to give it up. And he just takes the cigar and throws it into the ocean and never. He gives it up, as we say in the States, cold turkey. Cold turkey, he gives it away and never smokes again. And I was speaking to, yes, you have a question? Okay. A Orthodox Jewish man about smoking, because they smoke. I says, why do you guys smoke? He says, oh, because it's not forbidden in the Torah to smoke. In the first five books of Moses. Now, I believe it is. Uh, come with me to Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Yes, you need to use a little imagination. Yeah. But you find a reference. In Leviticus chapter 10, the third book of Moses. And let me say that when I go to Israel, I enjoy talking to Orthodox Jews. And, and I've even stayed with them. I've even gone to their synagogues with them on Shabbat. Uh, 10 verses 1 and 2. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereof and offered a strange fire. It says a strange fire. Yes, they were under the influence of alcohol, but the Bible says a strange fire they offered before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Tobacco, cigarettes, cigars, is a strange fire. It's an incense, a strange incense to a false god. The Indians, the Native Americans, would smoke as part of their religious experience. Now, here's another text. Exodus chapter 30, verse 9. We're reading from the Torah. Strange fire. Uh, Exodus 30, verse 9. It says, Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall ye pour drink offering thereon. So the Bible does consider that there is one type of incense that was to be used in the sanctuary. Any other type of incense would be a strange incense that God would reject. And this is a strange incense. You know, when you burn incense, it gives odor. It gives uh, a smoke comes out, and some of it is sweet. There's sweet incense, like frankincense. And there's this terrible incense, which is, comes from tobacco. And today we have vaping. That's very common among young people. Well, my wife tells me that they have these flavors, bubble gums, you know, to appeal to children, to get them. <laughs> addicted the smoke from tobacco contains over 1,000 dangerous chemicals over 1,000 nicotine being one of them and Sister White when she received this vision in 1848 it was 20, uh, 25 years 
after Joseph Bates gave up tobacco and was speaking against tobacco. Mm -hmm. And secondhand smoke is terrible. When I was a little boy, I spent most of my time with my grandfather. He was from the Canary Islands. And he smoked tobacco. So I spent the first four years of my life with secondhand smoke. And then my father smoked cigarettes. He smoked cigarettes. And one day, when we were living in New Jersey, he said, I'm going to give this up. And he took that cigarette and just threw it. And then he went, I think he says, five years without smoking. Then he took it up again. Mm -hmm. Then he said, no, I'm going to give this up. And he gave it up. And I don't think he has smoked in over 50 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Been able to put it off. And my grandfather gave it up too in his 80s. That's terrible, a terrible addiction. He gave it up when he became a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was in England and there they put these signs on cigarette boxes. In America, I'm looking at one right now. It says Surgeon General's warning smoking by pregnant women may result in fetal injury, premature death, and low birth weight. Well, in England, I saw the best sign. Warning. Smoking kills. Yes, I have that here too. Well, smoking kills. That's all you got to say. It kills. You don't need to say anything else. It kills. When I did my rotations in hospitals, looking at charts, in those days we had real charts that you opened up and you wrote in them. Now they don't. Everything is digital. Everything's on a computer. Even like my notes now on a computer. And I would see there was a lady or a man with lung cancer or emphysema nine out of every 10 cases they had been a smoker they gave it up sometime but they were still going to suffer from it and i still have that effect that i still cough a little bit and my mom coughs a little bit because of my grandfather who smoked all his life and he gave us all this secondhand smoke i don't think he did it on purpose he didn't know uh, physicians used to recommend you have uh, lung problems, go smoke. That'll help you. Like they do now. You you, you have a heart problem, uh, drink alcohol. Uh, listen to me. There is something called the French paradox. And I was in France at a medical meeting and they spoke about this French paradox. And they said the French drink a lot more wine than the Americans, yet they have a lower incidence of heart disease. And they call it the French paradox. How can that be? They drink all this with all their, their meals. They drink a lot more than the Americans, but they have a lower incidence of heart disease. But that's not all of the story. The researchers said the French have the highest level of stroke and higher levels of stroke than Americans. So it may help your heart a little bit, but it's going to destroy your brain. It literally shrinks the brain. When they've done autopsies with alcohol, it shrinks the brain. And I've seen the x-rays of people with cancer. I have pictures of them. With cancer, you have these cauliflowers that build up throughout the lungs, these cauliflowers everywhere, these tumors, because of the drugs in the tobacco our bible that we read is authorized by king james king james in the 1600s wrote a pamphlet against tobacco did you know that in the 1600s he said it was a filthy weed just like sister white later said, don't use it it makes you lose your teeth your teeth change color it has this terrible odor about you and it'll make you sick he said that in the 1600s. He wrote a pamphlet. And yet tobacco is now coming back up with this vaping. It's a cool thing among the youth, among women, among men. It smells good. You put it away. And, you know, It's terrible. Do not touch it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it smells like toilet pieces. <laughs> mm. 
In 1824, 1824, we continue to follow Joseph Bates. He's on a ship going to Brazil. On October 4th, 1824, what day is today? I missed it by a day. October 4th. Yes. He's on the ship. He's the captain. Captain's law. October 4, 1824. Joseph Bates accepted Jesus as his personal savior. He was on the ship Empress. He accepts Jesus. See how health reform is preparing his way. He gives up this liquor, this wine. Gives up this tobacco, and now he accepts Jesus. He accepts Jesus as his personal savior. He's been touched by reading the gospels. He's out at sea, and he says, Jesus will be my life friend, my savior. Now he takes a third step. In 1828, 1828, Joseph Bates discards tea and coffee. He's invited to somebody's house and he drinks some coffee and oh, he can't sleep the whole night. He's, they feel terrible. 1828. He gives up no more tea and no more coffee. Uh, there are several drugs that are found in these plants that are drunk. Um, you have coffee that has a xanthine drug. Called caffeine. And it has the same chemical formula as the one in black tea. Or green tree that is promoted for health. That's not really healthy. Green or black tea. And I'm not talking about herbal teas, which are healthy. These also have a xanthine drug, but it is called theophylline. Theophylline. It's a drug. That's a stimulant. It stimulates the heart. It stimulates the kidneys. The liver has to purify it. Theo means God. Theophilin. Means that it's a lover of the gods. Of the gods love. That's the name of the drug. Love of the gods. And then you have chocolate. <laughs> so that's tea. Let's call it cacao in Spanish, in English, cocoa, chocolate, that is so popular among us that also has a drug. And that drug is called theobromine. And it's a sister drug, it's a xanthine drug. They have the same chemical formulas with their different rings. It's just one of the alcohols on it is at a different location on the ring, on the benzene ring. Yes, and it hurts the heart. It damages the yes, heart. Yes, all of these hurt the heart. They hurt the brain. They hurt the liver. They're stimulant. There, there is a line or this, we have the number line where there's a stimulant line. And you can place them at different locations. There's another one called mate that is drunk in South America. That's another stimulant that has caffeine in it. Cola, um, another, the cola nut from Africa. Coffee from Arabia, um, chocolate from the Mayas. The Mayas would have these ceremonies drinking chocolate, drinks of chocolate till they would have hallucinations. And they would speak to the gods in terms of what they needed to do. They had these stellas. I've seen the stellas, these huge stellas 
with the pictures of their gods and, and, and dead generals and dead kings, and they do these ceremonies, dancing around it without eating, just having uh, chocolate. And then finally, they would hear and see these stones would talk, would move their lips and their eyes, and they would have these revelations. The Native Americans had that too, with their different rituals. Now, Bates discarded these drinks, tea and coffee, because they were intoxicated. He knew that his body was the temple of the Holy Spirit that Jesus wanted to live in him, so he put it aside. Uh, now, in natural medicine, some people, I was in, uh, I was in Florida, and these sisters came across this nature path person. He says, what you need to do is coffee a... Uh, Enemas? Enemas. That was the word I was looking for. Coffee enemas. Mm -hmm. So you take coffee and you take this tube and you, yeah. and you put it through your back and you clean yourself up. Coffee enemas. I said, no, this is dangerous. Mm -hmm. This is terrible. They contain stimulants, drugs, and it'll go into your system. Use it, herbs if you want, natural herbs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Medicinal herbs, but not coffee. Let's read in the scriptures. In the book of Matthew. Let's read Matthew from a health point of view. In Matthew chapter 13. And Jesus tells this parable that someone sows evil seed. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, verse 27. So the servants of the householder, Matthew 13, 27, came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field, from whence then hath it tares? And what does he answer? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? You know, there's a literal meaning in this story, and there's a spiritual meaning. But I want to look at a literal meaning. It is the devil inspiring scientists over time that have fabricated, degenerated, let's say, different plants and crossed them with genetic engineering to produce these amalgamations. Amalgamation. Sister White talks about amalgamations and I want you to know that God did not create coffee he did not create black tea he did not create cocoa or cocoa he didn't create mate he didn't create cola they were all the product of amalgamation the crisscrossing of genes over time under the inspiration of demons an enemy has done this, Jesus said. And we go to Matthew chapter 15, Matthew 15, 13. Now you can read it in testimonies to the church and in selected messages. There's several statements. You put in the word amalgamation, you'll see these references where Sister White says that God didn't create them. He didn't create any of these plants that are harmful. Or marijuana. Marijuana is the new thing today. We have, I don't know, just about most states, if not all states in the United States, have legalized marijuana. But companies have not. They will test people. And if you're using marijuana, you're not going to be driving our trucks. Yes, you will not. You will not be. Uh, machinery. Yeah, machinery. No. Yes. And so there, there are all these scams. You can go see a certain group of people and they'll give you this urine that is free and then you'll mix it, you carry it with you. And when they do the urine test, they use this false urine that they're <laughs> drug free, but it'll catch up with them with accidents. I love the study they did with marijuana, a very simple study. They gave marijuana to spiders. Okay, the spiders. And then they compared 
the web of the marijuana spiders mm. to the spiders that were not fed marijuana. And the web is a total chaos. Mm -hmm. It's a total chaos. Uh -huh. It's really, I think what Linda says is true. Marijuana is a gateway to worse drugs. Because I'm not going to compare cocaine or opium to marijuana. And now another thing that's very popular in the United States is LSD because LSD is not addictive. Marijuana is, coffee is, tea is, um, chocolate is addictive too. But LSD is not. But LSD is terrible because it opens the window to demons. And they have parties now. They talk about this in, in, um, in national public radio. The people come and you have a guide um, somebody in the health field, and then you take LSD and you have these remarkable experiences. You see the note A, what it looks like. Okay, you can smell it. You smell a high A or a high B. You smell it. Um, you can hear the color yellow. You can hear the color blue. I mean, it's a crisscrossing of the nerves and the brain. And that's what the devil wants to do. That's what demons want to do. They want to degenerate the human race to the point that we cannot think for ourselves, that we cannot choose. Yes, brother. Even if impression. It doesn't make a difference. It does the same thing. They can do the same thing. But we want to make a distinction between a narcotic that I'm talking about and other medicines that are life-saving that will not give you hallucinations. All these are very strong stimulants and many of them most of them can give you hallucinations yes coffee and tea will not but marijuana will i remember studying with a young man i was in university i lived downstairs he lived upstairs and i said let's study the bible he said sure we went through the book of daniel and then one day i show up to study with him and he had this big contraption he was smoking pot uh, that's what we call it pot weed so many different words and he says, oh, do you mind if I smoke while we study? And I said, yes, I do mind. I will not study with you. And he would tell me, he would go out the window and he'd fly. He would go to other places. <laughs> this is a gateway to worse drugs. We're becoming a very addictive society that later future governments can control the minds of men and women. Okay, Matthew 15, 13. Look, look what Jesus said mm -hmm. regarding these plants that are an amalgamation. So like life-saving drugs, I didn't give you any example, like insulin. Insulin saves lives. You don't take insulin, you'll die. There's no health natural remedy to cure type two. No, type one, type one diabetes. For type two, there is. You can cure type two mm -hmm. diabetes, but not type one. You have people that have had their thyroid removed. They need to take Synthroid. Um, otherwise, uh, that's thyroxin. Otherwise, they will swell up and, and die. <laughs> die. So these are life-saving drugs. I mean, antibiotics, some antibiotics are very good for, and um, you know, you don't get addicted to it. Yes. You're not dependent on it. Um, on insulin, you, you need it or you'll die. Um, so these are life-saving drugs. I want to separate those from narcotics that are not <clears throat> cocaine. They get people in the hospital. You go to the hospital, they'll give you cocaine. My dad had a heart surgery and they started to give him cocaine. They give him small dosages. And my dad woke up and uh, let me tell you, my dad has been in the pharmacy business all his life. Okay. My brother's in the pharmacy business too. And he told, he called the physician, he says, what are you giving me? He says, well, we're giving you a little cocaine. He says, don't give me that again. I don't sell it in my pharmacy. I'm not going to take it here. He refused to sell the really, you know, drugs that would produce abortion that were really strong narcotics. He refused to sell them and he wouldn't use them. He said that while he was under, under the effects of this drug, his bed got up and went out the window. He was flying over the, <laughs> the parking lot. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Matthew chapter 15, verse 13. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. There are plants that God did not plant, and they will be rooted up. Not all dinosaurs were created by God. Some were the product of amalgamation. And they didn't enter the ark, and they died. Some entered the ark, and they lived after the ark and went extinct. I mean, a crocodile. What is a crocodile? Uh, uh, a dinosaur. Uh, the Komodo dragon. That is a dinosaur. We give it a name. But the same thing in the plant world. Now, in the scriptures, we have, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 18, where God speaks against drugs. And I got this verse from the early Adventist pioneers as I was reading their works. And I checked it and looked it up and found it to be true. Deuteronomy 29, verse 18. Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations. Lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall. A root that beareth gall. And wormwood. Now my Bible has a little asterisk next to it. And, and it says poisonful herb. Yeah, poisonful herb. Gall. The Greek the Hebrew word is rosh. You know about a laboratory broche? Yeah, so this is broche. That's the Hebrew word. It was translated as gall. But it's a poison. It's a narcotic. Narcotic. Yev is the Hebrew, the Spanish word, yev. Go. The Egyptians, if you read the context, they're leaving. Yes, you have a question? No, the text, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 29 18. Thank you. 29 18. I have a slide presentation on all this. You're welcome to have it. Okay. But the Hebrew word is rosh, it means poison. The rabbis interpreted the word as opium. But we don't have a lot of evidence. It's, it's controversial whether the Egyptians use opium. But they used another drug, and we have a lot of evidence for that. Um, and that was lotus. The lotus, the blue and white lotus comes in white and blue. One opens, blooms in the morning, the other blooms in the evening. And you can see the lotus in, um, in many of the Egyptian, you know, it's a lily. Uh, and it blooms. And what they would do is they take the flower and they take alcohol, okay, a cup with alcohol. The, the Egyptians drank a lot of wine and a lot of beer. They made beer from barley. Uh, the, their beer making factories were next to the bread making factories. And they would take the flower and they crush it, squeeze it. So that the liquid from the flower would fall into the alcohol. Now you get a double boom. You get the, the narcotic. It's an alkaloid that's in this flower that's narcotic that can cause hallucination. And it would fall into the alcohol and preserve it. And they'd have these parties. The, the Egyptians, you'll see it in their hieroglyphics. And their physicians would write in their books in the Ebers Papyri. Papyrus, the Ebers Papyrus, which is the most extensive medical papyri that has been discovered. It's about 30 meters long, written in hieroglyphics. It speaks against the drug of the lotus. That didn't matter. The king was king. He did what he wanted. And they were also addicted to this lotus. Um, the mandrake was another drug they used. And we have evidence of the mandrake among Jacob's family. They were addicted to mandrake.
too, that also had these harmful alkaloids, Leah and Rachel, because they believed they had aphrodisiac uh, properties. So let there be no one among you. It says here, 29, 29, 18. So we have archaeological evidence for this. We have historical evidence. We have biblical evidence. We have evidence from the testimonies that beareth gall. And it shall come to pass when he heareth the words of this curse that he bless himself in his heart. You know, people that use drugs, this time, okay, I can give it up whenever I want to. They can't. It's not going to do me any harm. And it says here, and the Lord shall blot out his name under heaven. Uh, verse 19, that shall bless, uh, I shall have peace though I walk in the imagination of my heart and that drunkenness to thirst, thirst, it forms an addiction. Drunkenness, it's a stimulant. It alters behavior, mental thought, your ability to react. It distorts reality and it is self-deceiving. I'm okay. It's okay. Yes. They tried to give it to Jesus on the cross. That's correct. Yes. They gave it to Jesus on the cross, yes. gall with vinegar. Yes. It was offered twice to him that he accepted. Mm -hmm. oh, he, he refused. He would have lost our salvation. That's right. He refused yes. it, yes. Um, about Deuteronomy, um, that verse, verse 18, most other, I checked the translations, most translations say bitter, bitter, um, uh, a, a poisonous fruit and wormwood or a poisonous plant. Yes, a poisonous plant. Now, we see how Bates is progressing. Okay, Sister White is now, I believe, one year old. Yeah. Brother Glenn, and now we go, we continue, and we get to the year, one year before the great day of the disappointment. So we're going to go to year... 1843. And to me, this is remarkable. 1843, Bates becomes a vegetarian. He's a vegetarian. He's preaching about the soon coming of Christ. And he chooses, he resolved to eat no more meat. No more meat. This is not a new teaching. Uh, this was well known. In antiquity, have you, when you studied math, you remember the symbol A squared plus B squared equals C squared on the triangle? Mm -hmm. Yes. Algebra. Who, who invented that? Pythagoras. Did you know that he was a vegetarian? Yeah. Did you know that? Pythagoras was a vegetarian. He wrote in favor of vegetarianism. Um, there was a Roman author, his name is Ovid. He wrote a book called Metamorphosis. And in there, he quotes Pythagoras' words. And he speaks favorably about vegetarianism. He says, you should be vegetarian. You shouldn't be killing animals. It will harm you. He was a great vegetarian. As a matter of fact, they had Pythagorean clubs and those that were vegetarian were called Pythagoreans. Now something I skipped. Bates was instrumental in establishing one of the first temperance clubs in the United States of America. Sister White was would later grow up to be in favor of the temperance clubs. And these temperance clubs brought about prohibition in the 1920s. They finally outlawed prohibition. And I mean, I've studied American history all my life, and they always say that was a terrible time for America because the gangs were out and there was mafia and there was killing and people were drinking alcohol illegally. But if these people would look at the incidences of disease, they went down in America. The morbidity went down in America for chronic diseases. 
And so many statistics, you look at that, with the exception of the killing of, among the mafia and, and their groups, the nation was better health-wise. And we have proof of that. Okay, so Bates resolves to eat no more meat. And we believe what the scriptures say in Romans chapter 14, verse 21. Romans chapter 14, verse 21. That me make my brother, well, that's a different verse. But this is, it is good neither to eat meat nor to drink wine or to do anything that offends my brother. Yeah, 1421. It is good neither to eat flesh. The word is flesh. The Greek word is kreas. Kreas. When we read in the King James Version the word meat, it means food. But when we read flesh, it's kreas. It's not broma. Broma is a Greek word for food. Broma. Theobromi. You know, the food of the gods. So I'll read it again. Very important text. And we're going to read it with another text. 14. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. I want to tell you, not only your brother is made weak, but you're made weak too. Sister White wrote that when you eat flesh, you increase your risk for disease by 10 times. 10 times. Uh, they say you cannot raise children on being vegan. Look, I've raised all of my girls vegan. And two, two of them are in the university. Um, my oldest is in medical school. And my other child is uh, finishing, she's a senior in, in college. So it's not true that you need meat, that you don't get B12. B12 is fortified in so many foods today. Bacteria make it, our gut makes it. But you can store it in your liver up from seven to 20 years, I've read in the scientific literature. So there's a lot of false misinformation. Those that become B12 deficient, those are the new vegetarians. We're not new vegetarians. We've been vegetarians for generations. My wife was born vegetarian. Her daughter, we're all born vegetarian. Her father was born vegetarian. Her grandfather. So for, I can follow at least five generations on Linda's side through her mother, with your mom too, several generations back Adventist, vegetarian. It doesn't interfere with, and Linda's brothers are really tall. I mean, they're six, six, three, six, six three, yeah. Because they were raised vegetarian. Of course, gene play into it. I mean, don't don't yeah. get me wrong. But it doesn't stunt your growth is, is, is the point I'm trying to make. Now, if it is good, it's because God said in the beginning, this is good for us. Good. He created and he gave man a vegetarian diet, and he said it is good. Or using the term today, the, the new jargon today, the new term is plant-based, not plant-based diet. I uh, recommend plant-based. One more text, James 4, 17, on this point. James, just notice we have a clock right there conveniently in front of us <laughs> as we speak. I've read one preacher say, in the old days, you used to put a clock outside the church so the people would know to arrive on time. Mm -hmm. Now we put it inside to tell the preacher that he has to finish on time. <laughs> <laughs> James chapter 4, verse 17. And it says, therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him it is sin. So if I know it's good not to drink wine, nor to eat flesh, and I do it, it's a sin for me. It won't be a sin for the guy across the street. He doesn't know. But for me and for you, now you've read it, you know. Vegetarians live an average of seven years longer, and their incidence for many chronic diseases is reduced by 50%. And I can mention many Bible workers and ministers, ministers in our church that have lived a long life into their 90s. There's a lot more we could say here. Um, let me share this one story. At my dad's ranch, we had a little bull. 
we have animals for recreation. This little bull, we named him Ramoncito. Ramoncito. And Ramoncito was sick. He had some type like of TB. He had a bronchial problem. He was coughing. He was losing weight. He was getting thin. My dad was injecting him with antibiotics. They were giving him all types of therapies. We called my uncle, who's a veterinarian. Um, he told him what he needed to do. He called another veterinarian. And he says, look, you're going to have to sell this, hmm. this bull. And because he's going to die, you're going to lose your investment. Called another veterinarian, the same thing. This is, he's going to die. There's no, it's gone. Take it to the market. Sell it before you lose your investment. That's what they're telling my dad. And dad says, no, I'm going to keep him. And he died there with us. And we buried him. Ramoncito, you think other ranchers are going to do that? Do you think they name their animals? Once you name an animal, it's your pet. Do you eat your pets? Well, the bell rang. 1843. Um, 1844. No, 1845 is the next stage I'm going to give. There's something else in his life. I'm going to... 1843, Bates stops using cheese. No cheese. No butter. This guy's a real... No rich cakes. No sugary foods. Sugary cakes. And then 18, we're going to go to the last date. And that is 1845. Our dear sea captain starts to keep the Sabbath. When you read in the testimonies that Sister White is writing to a minister and saying, you do not have the right to tell Adventists to give up port. That was in the 1850s. That was Joseph Bates who was promoting health reform. Mm -hmm. And Sister White told him, no, you're wrong. And it's even in the testimonies, volume one. Mm -hmm. And she's even saying that, you know, God hasn't revealed it to her. And it's true. God didn't, had not revealed it to her. But she heard it years later in 1863. The dangers of pork. Um, yes, Linda, you want to say about yeah. the lady? Okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. Come here. No, no. So you can be taped. Come. Because <laughs> it's important. You don't want to see. All right. In what country was this? I don't remember. All right, there was a, an official publication out of a lady who had these terrible migraines. And they did research and they found worms in her brain. And they traced it to um, trichinosis mm -hmm. that comes from eating pork that has not been well cooked. So these worms reproduce and she had it in her brain. That's recent. 1845, Bates is keeping the Sabbath. And he later introduces that into Adventism. Adv there was already a church in 1844 that was keeping the Sabbath, and that was in Washington, New Hampshire. But they weren't vegetarians. Bates was. Yes, Linda? Oh, that was here in Australia. Oh, that was in Australia. Mm -hmm. Wow. There was a long season of liver. Oh, really? And they were still alive and written when surgeons pulled them out. Yeah, I remember. No, okay. See, the rate of the in the report, in the reform of the project, going through the transformation of health. I read somewhere that the first thing that he got for me that is marinated was Kirsten. Kirsten, yeah. Kirsten. Oh, interesting. That was the first thing he First thing. So, no so our dear pastor Andrade tells us that he read that the first thing he prohibited for his mariners that were on his sailors that were on his ship was no person. 
Yeah. Cursing and alcohol are very common. He say. progress. He progress very much. Mm -hmm. It's like a blessing. Yes, yes. I mean, the Holy Spirit was leading. Now, he was not the only one. Let me say that James White said that at age 20, James White said, looking back, he said, I never drank alcohol, liquor, liquor. I never drank liquor, never used tobacco, never drank coffee, never drank tea. James White. Mm -hmm. And that was before 1844, was it? Yes, because he was older than Ellen G. White. Yes. Yes. Uh, maybe somebody can Google when he was born and not 20 years. Yes. Uh, he may have been born in 1920, so 1940, yes, before 19, 1844. He also had a true sanctification. Yes. Little by little, and he was led by the Spirit. And we need to go up that ladder, too. Some people in the Reform are still using cheese and butter and, okay. and a lot of sugary foods. It's, yeah. it's not healthy. Yes. May the Lord bless you. Jesus came that we may have life, that we may have it more abundantly. And he's given us the way, and that is sanctification. Thank you very much. Amen. So the bottom line is that the health message started before 1863. Uh, that's my main point.